Good morning. I'd like to call the subcommittee hearing to order. This is the Military Construction, Veterans Affairs, and Related Agency Subcommittee. And this morning we have a hearing on whole, mental, whole health, mental health, and homelessness. Uh, today we will welcome Dr. David Carroll, the Executive Director of Mental Health Operations, Dr. Roger Casey, the Director of Education Dissemination at the National Center on Homelessness, and Dr. Tracy Gaudet, the Director of the Office of Patient-Centered Care. Dr. Gaudet, we invited you to testify today at the request of my colleague from Ohio, Mr. Ryan, who I I'm sure we'll be here at, at, uh, at any moment. Um, and he asked you to join us for this hearing to shed light on the great work you're doing to spearhead the whole health effort. Whole health is a relatively new venue of care at VA that goes beyond treating the physical symptoms of diseases and works to personalize health care plans for veterans that consider the physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, environmental needs of our veterans. As a Floridian, I'm happy to see that the Tampa VA Medical Center is the whole health flagship site in Vision 8 and the West Palm Beach VA Medical Center is one of the 2018 Whole Health design sites. And I'm optimistic to hear how the Whole Health initiatives will improve the health and lives of veterans. I know I've spoken to veterans in my district who have greatly benefited from Whole Health that have carried them through some of the most difficult experiences, uh, particularly when they were dealing with mental health challenges. Um, on a more somber note, just last week in my home state of Florida, a veteran reportedly fired seven shots in the emergency room in the West Palm Beach VA Medical Center Fortunately, no one was killed, but a VA physician was wounded. I'm grateful for the heroic actions of the VA staff and another veteran in the emergency room for subduing the shooter. However, we cannot afford to let people risk their lives because we can't provide adequate mental health care. From what I can tell, the VA medical staff followed all of the correct procedures for treating someone who said, who they, said were, who said they were suicidal, but this calls for a greater conversation for how we can better help and support veterans with mental health issues. An average of 20 veterans die by suicide each day. An average of six of those 20 veterans are recent users of the Veterans Health Administration services, meaning the remaining 14 veterans never received care from the VA. While we need better outreach to the veterans who were never seen by the VA, and I'll address that in my questions later, we need to find out how we can better support the veterans who do take that first step to seek help within the VA but still fall through the cracks. We cannot allow this to happen. And we certainly cannot tolerate a dramatic drop-off in suicide prevention efforts as we recently witnessed in media outreach spending. While I know the VA is working hard to bolster the men mental health programs, there is clearly room for improvement and more needs to be done. Effectively supporting the mental health of our veterans is one of my highest priorities on this subcommittee. Effective and robust mental health programs must be available to all veterans 24 hours a day, seven days a week, or we will continue to fail our veterans in our country. Which brings me to another area of concern, veterans homelessness. Most homeless veterans suffer from one or a combination of mental health issues. If we can dig deep and commit to addressing the root causes of homelessness like psychiatric and substance abuse diagnoses, we will be able to make more significant strides to ending veteran homelessness. VA announced back in 2009 that it would eliminate veteran homelessness by the end of fiscal year 2015. I'd like to commend the VA for their collaborative work with the Department of Housing and Urban Development and for successfully ending, ending veteran homelessness in three states and 66 communities. Under the Obama administration, veteran homelessness decreased by 47% between 2010 and 2016. And I challenge the current administration to build off of President Obama's success and leadership on this issue and continue the efforts to successfully eliminate veteran homelessness. VA's goal was to end veteran homelessness writ large throughout the country, but we have work to do in the other 47 states. That being said, Dr. Carroll, Dr. Casey, and Dr. Godet, we asked you to join us today because we want you to tell us how we can help you do your jobs better. We appreciate the great work that you all are doing in the whole health, mental health, and veteran homelessness spheres, and we need to continue the charge and work harder to deliver more for our veterans. Dr. Carroll, thank you again. Dr. Carroll, thank you again for being here today, and I look forward to your testimony and discussing these important issues with all three of you. Now I'd like to recognize uh, Ranking Member Carter for his opening remarks. Thank you, Madam Chair, for this, holding the hearing today. And I'm glad this sub, subcommittee has the opportunity to conduct oversight hearings. This is important. We, we're going to cover many, we've already covered many important topics, and this is a very important topic. Probably the veteran su suicide is one of our most vexing problems that we've got. The Department of Veterans Affairs is the leader in recognizing and preventing researching suicide in the middle and behavioral health issues related to it. VA's leadership in these issues ultimately helps all Americans. 
I also look forward to learning more about another way VA is a leader. This is the transformation of VA health care system. The VA is moving from a focus on treating disease to a focus on veterans' whole health. In other words, VA is becoming a health care system. Today, we will cover challenges and exciting top topics. Uh, as I've said before, there's no excuse for not having the best for those who serve our nation and the armed forces. And I'm sure that the, the, uh, the witnesses will they'll agree this applies to those who have served. I want to thank you for being here today. I look forward to your testimony, and I yield back. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Carroll, your uh, full written testimony will be entered into the record without objection. Um, if you could summarize your remarks in five minutes, and you know, as always, we'll go through the standard five-minute rounds for our questioning, alternating, alternating sides, and I'll recognize members in order of seniority as they were seated at the beginning of the hearing. And if members could be mindful of their time once we begin questions so that the question and the response can be completed in five minutes. Dr. Carroll, welcome to the committee, and you're recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Madam Chairman, Ranking Member Carter, distinguished members of the subcommittee. We appreciate the opportunity to discuss the mental health needs of veterans and how VA is addressing them by leveraging all of our capabilities in mental health, homelessness, and whole health. I'm accompanied today uh, by Dr. Tracy Gaudet, the Director of the Office of Patient-Centered Care and Cultural Transformation, and Dr. Roger Casey, the Director of Education Dissemination of the National Center on Homelessness. The health and the well-being of our nation's veterans, uh, those who have served in uniform, is the highest priority for VA. VA is committed to providing timely access to high-quality, recovery-oriented, evidence-based care that anticipates and responds to veterans' needs and supports the reintegration of returning service members into their communities. VA is working every day to meet the increasing demand for mental health services through cutting-edge research, education, and technology, supporting veterans where they work, live, and thrive. Madam Chair, as you noted, uh, we know that approximately 20 veterans die by suicide each day. This number has remained relatively stable over the last several years. And also, as you noted, of those 20, only six have used VA health care in the two years prior to their death, while the majority, 14, have not. Maintaining the integrity of the VA mental health care system is vitally important, but it is not enough. That's why we are implementing broad community-based suicide prevention strategies driven by data to connect veterans outside of our system of care with the support uh, and care that they need on national and local levels. In June 2018, VA published the first ever comprehensive national strategy for preventing veteran suicide. It outlined a broad range of evidence-based activities to support all veterans regardless of where they receive care. Although it is still in the initial planning stages, we believe that the executive order signed by the president this week will provide the opportunity to significantly advance that national strategy. Established in 2007, the Veterans Crisis Line is a life-saving resource providing confidential support to veterans in crisis. Veterans, as well as their family members and friends, can call, text, or chat online 24-7, 365 with a caring, qualified responder, regardless of VA eligibility or enrollment. However, we must do more to support veterans before they reach a crisis point, which is why we are working with internal partners like the Homeless Program and the Whole Health Program and with multiple external partners and organizations. VA remains committed to ending veteran homelessness. The goal is to make sure that every veteran has permanent, sustainable housing with access to high-quality health care and other supportive services, and that veteran homelessness in the future is prevented or is otherwise rare, brief, and non-reoccurring. VA has worked with communities across the country to identify veterans experiencing homelessness, to provide shelter to those uh, who need it immediately, to provide service-intensive transitional housing, to move veterans swiftly into permanent housing, and to ensure systems are in place to address the risk of homelessness in the future. 
As a foundation to all we do, VA is currently in the midst of a transformative shift of our overall approach to health care. Today, health, health outcomes in our country are poor. The U.S. ranked 37th in life expectancy despite spending far more on health care than any other country. It is time to radically redesign to create a health care system rather than a disease care system. VA is developing a whole health system that empowers and equips veterans to take charge of their health and well-being. VA facilities have been exploring what it takes to shift from a system that's designed around episodes of care, primarily <laughs> focused on disease management, to a system based on partnering across time with veterans, focused on whole health. <laughs> We have learned that clinical encounters that, like those we provide today, are essential, but are nowhere near sufficient. We need a health system focused not only on treatment, but also on empowerment and self-care skills. VA's goal is to meet veterans where they are in life and to walk with them to ensure they can achieve their goals, teach them skills, connect them to resources, and provide the care they need along the way. We want to empower communities to do the same for veterans who do not use VA services. Our objective is to give our nation's veterans the top quality experience and the care they have earned and deserved. We appreciate this subcommittee's continued support and encouragement. And this concludes my testimony. We'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Dr. Carroll, and appreciate your service. Um, you mentioned in your testimony that about 20 veterans die by suicide. I noted that as well each day. And we only have an average of about six veterans who accessed VA healthcare prior to their death. And the overwhelming majority of the 2014 have not. Um, and it's certainly good that VA is making a positive impact um, and some progress, uh, I, although it's difficult to put your finger on what that progress is, um, <laughs> has been made. Uh, there's got to be more that we can do. And, you know, we're, we're guilty of insanity if you keep doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Um, this is clearly a, a, a major mental health crisis. So I want to know what is the VA doing specifically to reduce the number of veterans that uh, have accessed VA health care who die by suicide? Has your strategy evolved over the years? Because it's, as you said, the numbers have not really changed much. Are you working with Dr. Godet and her team to incorporate whole health practices into mental health care? And then what about the 14 veterans who, on average who don't make it into the VA? Uh, how are you reaching out to veterans who don't know that they're eligible for VA health care or, or who aren't interested in it for various reasons? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate the question. There are multiple things that VA is doing differently today than we have in the past. Uh, with regard to what is going on inside of our facilities, all of our health care facilities have same-day access for immediate mental health care. If a veteran needs care today, they can be seen today in mental health care. We are also expanding our, our mental health care system. Uh, we have uh, increased the number... When did you implement the same-day care? within the last year it's available before that they couldn't get same day care at at most facilities they could but we have ensured that is it is it available across the board today uh, we are also we've added to our mental health provider base uh, over the last 18 uh, 19 months we have added more than 1,000 net new mental health providers we've actually hired clearly uh, nearly 4,000 mental health providers, but we've increased the number of mental health providers across our, our care system. Um, we have also worked then with the community to the 14th. We have partnerships with uh, over 60 different uh, organizations that may be providing care or outreach services to veterans. The national strategy that we have is looking at things that we can do for the entire population of veterans, things that we can do for targeted groups. Our effort over the last year to look at transitioning service members and to make sure that they are uh, have an easy transition into mental health care. We are working with our whole health care partners uh, around engaging newly transitioned service members into VA care. 
Uh, we are working on, on uh, closing gaps. And then uh, also looking at targeted groups, whether uh, women veterans are, uh, are a group of particular concern, homeless veterans, uh, National Guard and Reserve, uh, service members with other than honorable discharges. What we have uh, started doing is going after known groups that are uh, groups to be known at higher risk for suicide, as well as then uh, uh, ensuring that we have consistent processes for those in our care who we know are at greater risk. Dr. Harrell, my, my frustration is that all of the things that you just listed seem like things that should have been already, that you were already doing. Um, there's nothing groundbreaking <laughs> or earth shattering about the things you just listed. It feels like you're just throwing a bunch of stuff up on the wall and hoping, hope, hoping some of it sticks. Are, are you looking empirically at what can be done to reduce the suicide rate? Are you researching or spending time with experts who know how to get at this hard to reach population? And frankly, you, um, you, you cite the numbers on, on how many hires in the mental health area you've, you've um, engaged in, but the VA currently has 49,000 vacancies, of which almost 43,000 are within VHA. How many of those vacancies remain that are mental health clinicians? And, and what are the staffing challenges that you are facing providing mental health care around the country beyond just rural and remote areas? And how are we getting those positions filled? Um, I, I, I just don't have a lot of confidence that your response is demonstrative of going in a direction that's going to actually move the needle. Okay. The, the national strategy that we published last year is data in form. It has been reviewed by subject matter experts. We have had academic partners work with us on that. It is, it is data in form. It is evidence-based. The other things that we are doing with our Mayor's Challenge program in 24 cities and our seven uh, Governor's Challenge programs that are in mobilizing community resources, these are new things. Uh, that we have been doing uh, that are different, that are evidence-based, that are, are, are based upon the latest science and w doing it in partnership with others. Thank and you. And I would be happy to get you the vacancy numbers in mental health, ma'am. Okay, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Judge Carter? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Okay, uh, we've, we've heard now twice 20 veterans per day commit suicide. This, uh, and we're all worried about it. It's alarming. Uh, can you break this down for us? Does the statistic include National Guardsmen and Reservists? Does it include those who are other than honorably discharged? What else do you know about these veterans? How do our vet veteran numbers compare with the general population of the United States? How do they compare with numbers that we may have collected for World War II? Korea, Vietnam. Is there something different about this era than, than those eras? Or has anybody done that research? And I have an Army fellow who works in my office, and he's been in the service for quite a while, and he says really doesn't think the number of suicides has cha uh, changed much per year over the course that he's been in the Army. So can you give us an kind of a description of what we can compare it to. Is this a new phenomena, or is it something we need to look at Army worldwide? I don't know. I just, it, it confuses me. Uh, thank you, sir. And, and the statistics are, are alarming and concerning to us as well. And I think uh, what I can say is that the number 20 a day includes uh, those who are veterans and uh, as well as active duty. If you break it down, about one of the 20 would be an active duty service member. Uh, two to three roughly are National Guard and Reserve who have never been federally activated. And the remaining number would be those who are veterans and it would include uh, those with other than honorable discharges. The other thing that's, uh, in, uh, two other things that are important to note, the rate of suicide in the United States overall has gone up. On average, there are, I think, roughly 123 Americans who die by suicide every day. So it is, a, it is the 10th leading cause of death in America. So suicide is a public health issue in America of, of, of 
particular concern to us. It's an issue for veterans. Uh, veterans make up roughly 8% of the population and they account for roughly 14% of the suicides in America. We did see a small decrease in the number of suicides from 2015 to 2016 among veterans. That's the most recently available data, but a small increase obviously is not enough and it's, it's not where we are not at all uh, comfortable with where we are today. Uh, the the uh, the greatest number of deaths by suicide occur in older veterans, those over the age of 50. So it's that older cohort where the largest number of deaths, but very concerning to us is we have seen a increase in the rate of suicide. So the rate per 100,000 among uh, the veterans who are aged 18 to 34 in the last couple of years. And that is another uh, group that we are, are looking at uh, to, to target specifically. Is this a societal thing? I mean, I mean, we're looking at the mental health version of this, but is there something about our society that has caused and complicated people's lives so that they're committing suicide they can't, they can't hang on? Uh, there is no single cause of suicide. It's a multifactorial uh, system. That's what the, our scientists uh, tell us. It has to do uh, very often with a, uh, a lack of purpose or a sense of belonging. Um, and and uh, the, so there's no common single path, final pathway to suicide. It's when all of the support systems fail. Uh, we know that there's a, a problem in America with people coming forward and asking for health, particularly for mental health care. And so stigma around mental health issues is part of the problem uh, for us. But suicide uh, is not simply a mental health problem. The data from the Centers for Disease, or from the uh, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration uh, showed that in 2016, more than half of, the, of Americans who died by suicide did not have a mental health diagnosis and had not been in mental health care. We know from looking at our own data in VA, about 40% of veterans who die by suicide have never had a mental health uh, problem or been in mental health care. So it is a much larger issue than just a mental health issue, which is why we're going to the population strategies <coughs> to engage states and communities and looking at faith communities schools, uh, uh, employment, and, and working with employers to make sure that the veterans who are in work settings feel supported and also know that there are resources and that making the connection between veteran to veteran is so important. If I could ask one more question, I know my time's expired. Is this a governmental solution or is there somewhere we can point that somebody's doing a better job? Maybe the faith community or some other community, I don't know. It's a problem throughout our country. I mean, VA is, is interested and wants to learn from anyone who's, who's, who's doing a good job at this. We know that some uh, state guard associations have had success at reducing uh, the number of suicides among their National Guard communities, and we are working with those to learn from what they are doing so we can spread it across the country. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Mr. Bishop. Thank you very much, and thank you for appearing before our committee. Uh, Dr. Carroll, the story of Justin Miller, a 33-year-old Marine Corps trumpet player, an Iraq veteran who was suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder and suicidal thoughts when he checked into the Minneapolis Department of Veterans Affairs Hospital in February of 2018, deeply saddens me. His story after spending four days in the mental health unit, he walked his truck in the VA's parking lot and shot himself in the very place he went to find help. A federal investigation revealed that the VA made multiple errors, not scheduling a follow-up appointment, failing to communicate with his family about the treatment plan, and inadequately assessing his access to firearms. As you know, his death is amongst 19 suicides that occurred on VA campuses from October of 2017 to November of 2018, seven of them in VA parking lots. This must never happen again. Customer service within the VA department 
It's got to get better. What are the lessons learned uh, from these incidents? Are there employees who <coughs> failed our veterans? Are they still working there? Has, has disciplinary action been taken? And I might also want to point out that the GAO report, um, November 2018, highlights that the department only spent $57,000 of the more than $6 million that was budgeted for social media postings, public service announcements, and advertisements designed to help veterans with suicide prevention outreach. How do you justify that, particularly in light of what happened to Marine Miller? Sir, I appreciate your, your questions, and we certainly share your, your concern uh, over the events that have happened. And uh, to, to address both of them, first of all, to talk about the situation in Minneapolis, the tragic death of, of Justin Miller, as well as the, uh, the overall situation of on-campus suicides. Um, the, uh, the leadership of the uh, Minneapolis facility, as well as the, the network, and the failure to utilize the resources that were provided to you by Congress uh, to at least alert veterans to what opportunities they had when they felt suicidal. Yes, sir. Um, in the case of, of Justin Miller, the, the leadership have looked at that. There have been thorough reviews of it. There were uh, uh, miscommunications. There were, was a failure to communicate among various groups to consistently do that. That has been thoroughly reviewed by the facility. Uh, there have been changes made at the facility in terms of uh, communication strategies, uh, and I, we can follow up in terms of, of what, what has happened with the staff if, uh, for your information. I, d I don't have the details on, on, on the staffing situations. It please, has also been looked... follow up with that and let us know what disciplinary action, if any, uh, yes, actions sir. were taken. Yes, sir. We, our, our National Center for Patient Safety has reviewed on-campus suicides. They have an, uh, a report that has been published. There are pra best practices about uh, things that should be in place environmentally in parking structures. We've also looked over the last uh, couple of years at on-campus events. Uh, there does not seem to be a trend in this, but any event that happens on campus is, is unfortunate. We have also looked at, at why these events are happening on campus. There does not seem to be a common theme among these events. There was a, an event on campus where the veteran left a note saying, I know the VA will take care of me uh, and my family. So it, it is a multi-cause you know, cause kind of uh, a thing. We are uh, all over this in terms of looking at making sure our, our teams are communicating after inpatient discharge is a particularly difficult time. I want to get to your second point about the GAO report and the spending. We did spend less on paid media in 2018 than we had originally budgeted, although paid media is one part of a much larger communication strategy for about social media as well. Yes, yeah. but, but our overall uh, communications and outreach spending for suicide prevention in 2018 was $10.5 million. We did not spend as much in paid media as we anticipated. There were a number of new innovative programs regarding um, our partnership with around some uh, no cost to VA uh, public service announcements that were launched that year. We've also looked at our paid media to see how we can better target it uh, and that was also the time at which we were developing the national strategy. Did you have enough staff? Our, our national program office suicide prevention staffing has increased uh, significantly over the last year and a the half. Communications part of it. Yes, yes. We have a new communications contract for suicide prevention outreach. My time has expired. Okay. So. Just, just so I can make sure I get the specific answer and it not be glossed over, my understanding of why that fund, those funds weren't spent is because the office was understaffed and that it wasn't an intentional lack of expenditure. It was a result of there not being the proper personnel to be able to implement the strategy. 
Is that correct? Madam, I would say, uh, Chair, it it's, was multifactorial. The, the staff, the office was, uh, had a small staff at that time. That is correct. But we were also redoing the strategy uh, for what we were doing by way of communications uh, and outreach. We were also in, engaged in some no cost to VA, our partnership with Johnson & Johnson, some Facebook events, uh, some other partnership activities. But yes, it was it was a low staffing time and we have increased okay. it since then. Well then, <coughs> if you're asked that question, then you, you should acknowledge that because your testimony is differing from when we asked the secretary what the problem was. Okay. And it, what the primary driver of that problem? It was understaffed, and we did not have a permanent director for suicide prevention. Right. So, okay, yes. just wanted to make sure that I confirmed that that was yes. accurate. Yes, Ms. Roby. Thank you all for being here today. Um, I want to take a minute, Madam Chair. I want everybody to look around the room, and I want you to count twenty people. And I want you to imagine if we all came back here tomorrow, and those twenty people weren't here. And think about the emptiness in this room. And then I want you to imagine if we came back the next day and 20 more people were missing from this room. This can't just be a number. And I want to focus in on the fact that only six of those 20 people had received VA health care in the two years prior to their death. And I want to make a suggestion about why that is the fact. I know that there are some VA facilities in this country that are better than others and execute on a daily basis better than others. But I want you to look at the facilities like in my district, in Central Alabama Veterans Health System, and all of the problems that we have, and they are many. And I want to suggest to you that a reason that some of these veterans are not accessing care through the VA is because they no longer have trust in the VA system to take care of them. You know, word gets around very quickly when a veteran walks into a healthcare facility and is ignored and is treated badly, or their friend who went for mental health care and no one followed up and their friend ultimately committed suicide. The VA has lost faith with our veterans community. And I hear all of the things you're saying uh, about improvements for mental health in particular. But I think sometimes what happens around here is in Washington, in the bureaucracy, there's a lot of good ideas and how are we gonna implement, but there's never really an effort to drill down on what's happening in these individual health clinics. And so you talked about same day care. Um, I wanna know specifically, um, and, and we talk about statistics, I will tell you the anecdotal evidence is oftentimes much stronger. Um, I wanna know specifically, particularly to our clinics that are, are one stars, which I have a whole nother issue with that, and we can address that another day. Um, the bell curve system where we're forcing clinics to be a one star when we should want all of our clinics to be a five star. But I think sometimes the folks here uh, at the top level are not truly understanding what is happening on the ground in these individual health healthcare facilities. And I'm I'm sad to report the number of times, and I'm happy to sit down with you one-on-one -on -one and give you some specific examples, where veterans have come to Central Alabama Healthcare Facility seeking care for mental health, and to my colleague who shares this vision with me, um, there was no follow-up, and it led to a loss of life. Um, and so I would just say to you, as there are recruitment efforts from varying um, veteran service organizations to get individuals plugged into the VA so they are, they are seeking care, um, I'm going to suggest to you that we've got a real problem in some of our health care systems across this country where we have failed our veterans time and time again, and they have given up. And this is a contributing factor to 
uh, the 20 people a day that are committing suicide. And I hope, I'm, I've only got one minute, I'm happy to hear your response, but I'm also happy to sit down with any one of you to discuss this uh, uh, further. Thank you, ma'am, and I appreciate and, and share your concerns. Uh, and uh, restoring trust is our prime effort. And I believe when the secretary was here, he talked about customer service being our prime directive in, in VA. Uh, both he and Dr. Stone are committed to that, and we are, we are taking that. Uh, Can I just interrupt you please. for a second? That sounds great, but I'm telling you it isn't happening. I understand that, ma'am. Okay. I, I, I do understand that, and I accept that. And uh, from our office, we have uh, a group of staff whose job is to go out to facilities and to work with them to try and improve their programs. And uh, uh, we are committed to doing that. We do uh, have to work with local leadership, you know, to gain their engagement with us. But but we are are trying to have boots on the ground at local facilities to help them improve access, to help them improve trust. We do uh, satisfaction surveys specifically for veterans in mental health care. I, I accept the fact that there may be veterans who aren't coming into care and who may have different opinion about mental health care, but we are really trying to reach out to all of those veterans and working with our VSO partners as well. Madam Chair, I know my time has expired, but if I may, um, our one-star rating at Central Alabama Veterans Health System right now is largely due to the, to the veterans' experience. And so when you're talking about reaching out to healthcare systems to help them with this issue, I invite you to Alabama uh, to work directly with the leadership there so that we can execute on this. There is... This is not rocket science. Being kind to someone who has put their life on the line for freedom and liberty should not be something that takes more than two seconds to correct. And so I would invite you uh, to please come and help us in, in Central Alabama get this right for our veterans. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're, you're welcome, and thank you for your advocacy. And I'll just add that the service and care that we provide to our veterans should not be dependent upon the luck of their geographical location. And it seems that that is the case. So that is something that needs to be a top priority and that this committee is going to help you at the VA make it a top priority. Mr. Ryan. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I want to thank you and your staff for putting this uh, hearing together. I think this is a super important hearing. I want to I uh, talked to uh, Tracy uh, Gaudet, the Director of Office of Patient-Centered Care. I know you've been working for a while, and I believe that what you're doing is really one of the bright spots in the VA. Can you tell us, you know, we only have five minutes here, but can you say in a minute or two when you got in, I believe in 2011, <clears throat> when you got in, what, what the goals were for this particular uh, initiative and from that day to now, what progress you've made? Sure, absolutely. Thank you very much, Congressman. And um, as you might be able to tell by the name of our office, which includes cultural transformation, the vision of VA for our work um, when I arrived in 2011 was nothing short of a major transformation of what and how we think about health and healthcare and how we deliver it. So truly a broad sweeping cultural transformation that clearly links with the issues of mental health and how do you actually support people not only in treating their disease but in living a life that's full and has meaning and purpose. And that's not what current healthcare is designed to do. So we set about on the first, literally probably the first five years were a series of over 200 pilots and then design sites to begin to say, how do we actually implement this? It all sounds good, but how do we do healthcare differently so that we are empowering and equipping veterans to take charge of their health and well-being and live their fullest life? 
that's the goal of this approach to healthcare. But how you do that is entirely different from how we're set up. So after about those first five years, we had a lot of lessons. We now have a very comprehensive whole health system that includes not only evolving how the clinicians are trained, but the big aha for us was we can't just do it in the clinic. So the two other elements of this healthcare delivery model are peers, veterans who are trained to reach out to other veterans to help them discover or rediscover their sense of mission and purpose and aspiration and what they want their health for. Once veterans are engaged in that way through peers, it can be in the community, then they have not only their clinical team but well-being programs where they learn new skills like mindfulness, like um, nutrition and movement, new skills to actually address their health and well-being. And art therapy and... Art therapy, absolutely. It's a much more holistic approach because when you start to think about how do you support someone's well-being, things like the arts come in, you know, a whole array of, of strategies like acupuncture, yoga, tai chi, and the veterans where this is happening. We, through the CARA legislation, the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act, we have 18 flagship facilities, one in every one in every network, implementing the full system. And in, we have 140 facilities in total working on this. Mm -hmm. But we're getting tremendous outcomes in those facilities. Great. What? What? Um, let's talk briefly about the outcomes. Well, it's interesting that um, the primary veterans that are choosing these approaches have mental health concerns and or pain, and of course those are often hand in hand. While the data is early in those 18 facilities, they were just launched in FY18, we're seeing that veterans who are choosing to use whole health have, um, are using and spending less on opioids than the cohort that is not using whole health. They, their satisfaction and their meaning in life has tremendously shifted. How about nutrition? Diet nutrition and is key. And actually, I know we don't have much time, but I have a veteran quote. It feels important to me to bring the veteran voice in. So it, may I add just sure. one, just to, just to help the committee understand how these concepts are linked. So this is a, a veteran, a 37-year-old veteran. I used to drive over the Mississippi River Bridge to the Jefferson Barracks VA and think about jumping every time. <clears throat> the whole health system has helped me explore my purpose find ways to use nutrition to reduce my pain, and use eye rest and Tai Chi to get moving again. Now I drive over that bridge and think about tomorrow. I have oh. hope. Oh. And that is not an unusual story. I mean, that's what I would like to convey, that, that this is happening across the nation where we are implementing this approach. Yeah, I, I, I'm so excited about the possibilities here. I obviously work in this field too and do a lot of work with vets and see them heal and yes. and you give them tools yes. that, that they can take outside of the clinic or outside of the hospital and use in their everyday life uh, and lives and it's it's really really powerful i remember when we first went to the va i i can't remember when uh 10 years ago and we went to the dc va and there was mindfulness-based stress reduction, there was yoga, it was all kind of weird at that point. <laughs> and, and I went back five years later and all the classes were booked. Yep. They, no, they, they, could, they had to add classes, people couldn't get into the classes and the vets were kind of complaining a little bit about it. And, and this is, when I see these vets, this is what they want it because is. it gives them the ability to take care of themselves. And the peer support is huge. Uh, you know, we'll probably have another round of questioning, I think. So I'll, I will get back into it. But I, I just want to say thank you and hope members of this committee and people watching recognize that this approach is going to reduce costs around prescription drugs. Absolutely. And all of, you know, the trajectory we see there is, is so high. Suicides have been stable. And these, these programs are working. We just got to yeah. scale them up. So thank you for the example. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ryan, for making this such a priority. I'll tell you, I just went to the Denver, Medi Denver VA Medical Center, and the same is true. You know, it's a brand new, gorgeous facility, and all of their whole health classes are booked as well and have wedding lists. And I've got just a friend of mine who I met, Dan Evans. I don't know if you know Dan, but he's a veteran, double amputee, struggling with post traumatic stress, um, you know, served a few years back could not get himself right. Someone said, you need to start doing yoga. <laughs> he is now teaching hot yoga 
<laughs> to other vets so that they can go out and teach it. And it's it's like you're crying in the middle of a yoga class with this guy because he's he, his story is so powerful. And, you know, these are the kind of things that, we, as you said at the beginning, Madam Chair, the same line of thinking that caused the problem cannot be used to solve the problem. And I think the patient-centered care approach is the new line of thinking that we all can explore. So I'm, thank I'm you thrilled. So thank you. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Dr. Godet. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Dr. Carroll, I appreciate you being here. I know this is a, a difficult problem and that folks are, are concerned with it. And I am not a mental health professional, so I apologize for the basicness of some of these questions I may ask. Um, you, you gave a stat that 40% of the people that have committed suicide have never been in a mental health facility. Now, were you just making that as a statement of fact, or were you saying that that is not an indication that mental health is connected to suicide? Um, I was emphasizing the point that suicide is not simply a mental health <laughs> a problem in the United States. The 40% the number is when we've looked at veteran suicide deaths. Of the veterans who have died by suicide, roughly 40% have never, uh, they've never had a mental health diagnosis. They've never had a, a bed that in treatment. That just be because they haven't been to a facility and they didn't know that they were supposed they, to? Do they were enrolled in, in, in some care or uh, uh, whether or not they were had a problem and were never diagnosed, I don't know that answer, sir. Because it makes it sound like that you're saying that there's absolutely, potentially no mental health connection to suicide in those cases. I, we do not know that for sure, but we have to look beyond our mental health care system because for not sure. all, all I, of those re receiving mental health care. Right? That's a good copy. Um, I'm assuming the strategy to deal with the six out of the 20 or the 30 percent that that come into a VA facility is going to be different than the strategy of those that have never come into the facility. Now all of our staffs we deal with veterans every single day and so what is your if there is there one thing can you help us narrow our focus that when we are engaging with veterans that are calling coming in we're, we're helping them with their casework is there one thing that we can be doing um, to ensure that they're properly connected to um, you know, the resources they need to ensure we're preventing suicide? There are probably several things that you can do. I think connecting veterans with each other, the power of peer support is incredibly important to make sure that there's that social connectedness. Uh, and that's one of the most difficult things when people leave the active duty. They don't have that unit cohesion anymore. So making sure that they're connected with other veterans. I think making sure that they understand that there are resources available and that there are other veterans who have come forward with their uh, concerns in life, done something about it, and their lives are positively changed. So are we seeing a decrease that the, the veterans that are participating in the patient-centered care, are we seeing that cohort less of them committing suicide than ones that are not part of that cohort. We don't we are tracking that data and we don't have the numbers yet. So in the 18 flagship facilities, mental health, opioid use, suicide are are some of the many outcomes that we're tracking. We'll have more data in about 6 to 9 months and a final report in March of 2021. <laughs> Dr. Carroll, I don't uh, expect you to know the answer to this question, um, but we should be able to know all the veterans that have never been into a VA clinic. Is that a fair statement to make? We should be able to identify all the veterans who are not enrolled in VA care. That's correct. Um, we, could, we could identify those, I would think. So, so your response indicates to me that you've never thought to identify that group of people. Well, we know the veterans who are receiving care, and we yeah. know those who are not we, receiving We should have records to know everybody who's ever served in the military, right? That's correct. So therefore, the remainder, we should be able to identify right. them. What are we doing? Are you going to use that? Madam Chair, was it $6 million that was unused, right? Um, I, I believe that's the amount, yes. You got $6 million that you can use to talk to those people. Yeah, and, and so, actually... So, so let me rephrase the question. Okay. If we know, if we can find out that group of people that have never been in the VA, what are we doing to talk to that group of people? 
Um, this year, uh, in FY19, we have a, a suicide prevention outreach budget of $20 million. We have already obligated $14 million of that. That is going out nationally to anyone who has ever served uh, in service. Currently this week, uh, there are public service announcements that are being uh, hosted in Times Square. We are working with a, an organization. We will have uh, over uh, 400 uh, uh, billboards up across the country uh, pushing and how out. are you deciding where those billboards go right if you don't know who that population of people is that we try to talk to um, I'm assuming they're not all in Times Square in That's New York correct. City um, so you know one of the things that would be welcome and again I, we may have it I haven't seen it what are all the tools right you know we know this panel up here knows how to talk to people because that's our responsibility and our job right and it would be nice to see what y'all's plan is on how to ensure that those veterans that have never been connected with VA facilities, what we are telling them that they have access to and how we're reaching to them. And if we already have that information, we appreciate it. If we don't, um, can you please submit it to the committee? We, we will get it to you, and we're going to be here next Wednesday for a VA Day on the Hill talking about suicide prevention. So. Thank you. I'm sure I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Mr. Case? Uh, thank you. First of all, I, I want to associate myself with the remarks of my colleague, Mr. Ryan, um, on the patient-centered approach and the whole health approach. I mean, it sounds like exactly the right direction to go from my perspective, although I also associate myself with uh, my chair's comments uh, to, not to put words in her mouth, but what I heard uh, was um, this has to be more about, this has to be more than just about kind of rearranging the chairs. It has to be about, uh, actually doing something different and then implementing it and being sure that you ask us for the resources to get it done. So the direction is great, but you know, we just have to get there. Um, two quick um, kind of areas of, of um, questioning. The first has to do with home, home, veterans homelessness, which strikes me as just one of the worst indicators of failure in the system when a veteran is out there actually homeless and on the streets alone. Um, we have actually seen a, a, a downtick in this in, in Hawaii, so something seems to be going well there. Uh, although an incredible number of veterans are still homeless in Hawaii, and I'm sure this is the case in any one of our districts. Um, one thing that happened uh, in Hawaii, and I'm talking about the VASH program at the, at, at the moment, I think the figures are that um, somewhere in the range of 30 to 40% of the vouchers are actually unutilized. Uh, is that a national, um, and and why why would why would you not fully utilize the vouchers in that program? What are, what are the reasons for that? Is that outreach or is that what? Sorry about that. Excuse me. Just give me a second. There. Okay. Thank you uh, for the question. Sorry about the awkwardness here. I appreciate the question. Uh, yeah, so I just became aware of that uh, about the hud -Vash vouchers in your district. I called and uh, talked to the uh, acting director of the hud -Vash program, and they're working with the uh, network homeless coordinator that oversees that. Uh, so we can get back to you on that, but I'm not sure. That's not usually the case Usually 80% of our vouchers, up to 80 to 85% of the vouchers are utilized and leased up. So it's a little bit unusual. Okay. I, so. I know there was a concern about the cultural differences in your area. Um, just to let you know that uh, we provide some fairly significant training, and we have some training coming up on cultural diversity and uh, how our staff may um, uh, work with those diverse populations, uh, especially in the homeless population. So. We're aware of that and providing training uh, actually coming up this year. Yeah, um, thank you. I, I didn't mean to, I, I do mean to focus on Hawaii, but I also was interested in whether there's a national trend. So if you're telling me it's more Hawaii specific, then I really appreciate you yes. looking into that. Yes. Um, so on cultural differences, which is actually was my, my next question, and Dr. Carroll, you know, you, you made reference to um, ethnic uh, differences in terms of veterans' populations and how you, and how you reach them. And, and I have, um, um, as has already been alluded to a, a, um, a quite different population perhaps than many places, although perhaps not that much different. Uh, in, in Hawaii, we have, um, you know, um, Asian Americans are in the outright majority um, in Hawaii, um, although nationally, of course, they're in the minority from, from a veteran's perspective as well as any other perspective. Um, there have been um, well-documented -document, studies 
um, in reputable, reputable journals of health recognized widely that there are great differences in um, Asian Americans' cultural receptivity to mental health outreach. Uh, they're just simply three times more less likely to seek uh, mental health to start with uh, for various reasons uh, than, for example, uh, Caucasians. I um, mean, of course, if you, in a population like Hawaii, and again, I'm sure this is true of other districts across the country which have a different cultural mix, uh, you quickly realize that one size doesn't fit all in terms of mental health outreach. And so my question does have to do with what you are doing to try to try to match the outreach to these, these um, c cultural differences and sometimes barriers in terms of, of, of reaching veterans. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, certainly working with the local communities. So through our programs like the Mayor's Challenge Program and the Governor's Challenge Programs, working with both communities and states is a key important ingredient of, uh, of that. So the local community can identify what is going to work in Hawaii or Rhode Island or wherever it may be in terms of, 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 of what that local community needs, as well as increasing that veteran to veteran contact to make sure that, that veterans are working with each other and that we're also connecting families to each other, military families to each other. That has to be part of our community outreach work. Thank you, and, and VSOs also, don't, don't leave them out of that mix. Yes. They, also have, yes, they often have the best connections and best understandings. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Case. Ms. Bustos? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, before uh, coming to Congress, I spent about a decade of my career working in healthcare, so I do understand the complexity of, of what your job is, and especially when it, as it pertains to mental health. Um, it's, it's complicated, and um, so I, I do understand that, and so I want to kind of set the, um, that foundation and, and let you know I have an appreciation for the hard work that you guys do. Um, so I live in a bi-state area uh, along the Mississippi River, so uh, we are literally considered, it's called the Quad Cities, and two of the cities are in Iowa, two are in Illinois. I, I happen to live in Illinois. And um, we, there was a resident from our region who went to the VA hospital that serves basically the whole western part of my congressional district that I serve. And um, he went in seeking inpatient treatment. And you probably know this case. Um, was turned away and then committed suicide. And um, so my uh, colleague, uh, Congressman Dave Lobsack, who represents eastern Iowa, He's introduced a, a piece of legislation that would require the VA to provide any veteran who enrolled in the VA health system with inpatient psychiatric, psychiatric care if they ask for it. And then if there's not the space within a VA facility, then the VA would be responsible for finding um, a place for inpatient treatment for such a patient who would be seeking that. Um, so I, I just wanted to hear from and any of the three of you or all three of you can answer this, but what are your thoughts about that piece of legislation? Is it doable? Um, how can we make something like that happen so we don't have people turned away when they're at a point in their lives where they feel like th they need such help that they um, are asking for inpatient treatment? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you, and I appreciate the question. Um, it, the first thing that comes to my mind is, is the whole aspect of, of customer service, if you will, and, and our service to our, our veterans. I think that has to be our number one job. If they come to us and express a need, I think we need to understand what they're asking for and to help address that need. Uh, and and that, that's our prime directive. And, and whether it's, it's uh, medical care, whether they need uh, help with housing or a job, I think we, we need to understand, and it goes to the work that Dr. Gaudet is doing in terms of that patient-centered care. That's the first word in, in the name of, of the office, and, and it's a joint effort between mental health and, and whole health working together. Um, I, I think we also uh, need to make sure that we're supporting our providers and, and uh, we rely on our, on our uh, mental health providers to make the best clinical decisions, to make the recommendations with, to the patients about we believe based upon our understanding of science and the evidence that this treatment or that treatment is best for you. 
let's do it together and let's uh, uh, we're working uh, to roll out measurement based care across our mental health care system so providers and patients can look at outcome measures together and say yes this is working or no it's not let's do something else and so in real time we can make those adjustments so it's Ultimately, we need to make sure that the we've changed the culture so our care is patient-centered, informed by what the patient needs, and the provider feels that they are enabled to, to uh, provide the services that they have identified. Is it practical if you don't have the space? And, and I don't know if you uh, encounter that where literally you don't have enough beds for inpatient and psychiatric care. Um, is it practical to say you will find um, inpatient psychiatric care someplace else in the region? Yes. If a veteran is at a VA facility and needs inpatient psychiatric care, it's our obligation to find a bed for them. Okay. Dr. Gaudet, do you have anything to add to um, this answer? Uh, not regarding the legislation, but I would agree that the more outreach we do through not just our clinical paradigm, but through peers and reaching other veterans, it's incredibly powerful. Okay. Um, just, uh, I, I've just got a few, uh, about three quarters of a minute left, but um, I know Congressman Bishop and Congressman Hurd both asked about the, the fact that you spent less than 1% on this, of the $6.2 million on that. Is there anything else that you didn't have time to answer before about how you will use those resources to make sure that uh, veterans who need help will be able to know about the services? Uh, any, anything else that we didn't ask you about that you could lend credence to? Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to follow up. So I think uh, uh, our paid media strategy is an important part of this larger outreach and communications plan. And so we do pay, pay for other things by way of outreach and communications in addition to paid media. We also have had the opportunity to uh, partner to have uh, no cost to VA advertising. We've uh, done a number of Facebook Live events. We have uh, partnered, all of our partner organizations put information about VA resources, including the Veterans Crisis Line, on their web pages. So we are looking at multiple channels. We're also trying to target our paid media advertising. One of the things that we have seen is that sometimes when we do a big paid media push, a lot of non-veterans contact our Veterans Crisis Line, and the responders at the Crisis Line are never going to turn anyone away, but we, we don't want to make sure that we are uh, uh, driving so much work to the crisis line that they can't answer calls for, for veterans. So we're also trying to be more strategic in some of our paid media advertising so we really reach the veteran population. Okay, I want to thank the three of you for being here. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. You're welcome. Thank you, Ms. Pustos. Mr. Cartwright? Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and Madam Chair, thank you for holding this really important hearing. And thank you to our witnesses, Drs. Casey, Carol, and Gaudet, uh, for taking our questions. Um, eight days ago in Palm Beach County, Florida, and you know this story, uh, a double amputee uh, was admitted uh, involuntarily in the VA center there in R Riviera Beach. Uh, he was done so under the Baker Act. Every state has involuntary commitment statutes. In Florida, it's the Baker Act. Um, he was uh, examined, and uh, during the course of this, uh, he produced a, a pistol uh, and shot two, uh, two of the, the workers at the VA center, uh, one of whom was, the, uh, was a physician who was uh, heroically in the process of subduing him. Um, uh, thankfully, both survived and are in treatment. Uh, but um, everybody was asking, how in the world? I mean, when you have somebody who's being involuntarily admitted because of psychiatric problems, um, how in the world uh, does he get into a VA center uh, with a loaded weapon uh, like that? Uh, are there standards for, for these things? Um, what light can you shed on that? Uh, yes, sir. And, and um, we are grateful that no one was seriously injured in that event, and we applaud the heroic actions of the, the VA staff there. It... it um, 
their immediate response, uh, I, I think, shows the effectiveness of some of the training. All of our, our staff in emergency rooms and on psychiatric facilities have been, you know, trained in the prevention and management of disruptive behavior, so they're ready to you know, immediately respond as, as needed. Um, we work very closely with VA police and security to make sure our campuses, uh, I, I don't know if that had been completed, but th there are standard procedures in place that certainly if someone who is being involuntarily admitted, uh, there is a very thorough um, review of their person and their belongings to make sure that they are not bringing any uh, dangerous items into that that space such as a locked psychiatric unit. All right, I take it then that the, the, the case is under re review to make sure the procedures are appropriate. Yes, sir. All right, I want to move on to homelessness. The root causes of homelessness, homelessness in general have been well documented, including uh, sudden job loss, family breakdowns, severe substance abuse, mental health problems. Combat veterans obviously face additional stressors um, and substance abuse. That's another way of saying that combat veterans are more at risk for homelessness. Everybody agrees that the solution is homelessness. Everybody agrees that the solution is comprehensive approach that includes support services, shelters, transitional housing, uh, counseling, more low-income housing. My question is, if combat veterans face more than their fair share of the root causes of homelessness, are they getting the extra help they need on the solution side in the area of housing? Sure, thank you for that question. Um, so, as you stated, multiple causes and societal factors and how folks respond to adversity reason folks are homeless, veterans are homeless. Uh, we find that there's a slight indication that if veterans were in combat, there's more risk for homelessness. Um, what we also found was very interesting, though. We've done a number of studies, and there seems to be just as much or equal predictors of homelessness before military service. And the National Center is looking at that more in depth this year. But Actually, a small study out of the University of Pennsylvania, a small qualitative study, interviewed about 14 veterans or so. And the veterans said that they're homeless. These were homeless veterans. The veterans said that their homelessness was more of a result of job loss, marital problems, other kinds of structural problems, rather than combat. So I just wanted to share that with you. That's some of the latest research. Um, but um, the VA homeless programs they're amazing. I've been with the VA homeless program since 1987, and I'll share a story if I have time, but maybe not. Um, we provided outreach to 13,000 veterans just in one program last year. Um, we know that veterans coming out of incarceration, jails, prisons, are more likely to be homeless, and we have VJO, Veterans Justice Program outreach folks that are going into the jails, identifying who's a veteran and helping them upon release. Um, the, I wanted to share this with um, Ms. Bustos, but um, in 2009, uh, we set up low demand programs, 14 safe havens, low demand programs, low barrier, so anybody could come in, regardless of how bad they looked, low barrier, anybody was welcome to come in. Uh, those programs have grown to over 30 now around the country under the grant per diem funding umbrella. I'm getting a little bit off track here, but so I think our system, our homeless program system, no wrong door, coordinated entry at uh, many of the communities around the country, by name lists, is this kind of net that we hope welcomes veterans regardless of combat experience or other kinds of um, contributing factors to homelessness. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Cartwright. Ms. Pinkery? Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair and Mr. Ranking Member for holding this hearing, and thank you all very much for your, for your testimony and for your work to um, uh, take good care of our, our veterans. Um, I'm going to follow up on some homeless veteran questions. Um, I know it's always horrifying when people hear that there's even one homeless veteran on the street, the idea that you would serve your country and then end up back at home. 
um, without the services that you need. And certainly in Maine, we've um, got some really heroic organizations and individuals who work with homelessness and, and really keep their focus on homeless veterans. And I think particularly when the weather's this cold, if it's cold like this in DC, imagine what it's like in Maine. And no one should have to spend a night um, or a day on the streets in this kind of weather. Um, two kind of specific questions about some of the obstacles. Of course, um, we never have enough um, HUD vash housing vouchers. We have way more people who would like to get them than are available. So one of my questions, and I'll just put two or three things out there and let you guys talk. Um, I mean, one is certainly what are we doing to, you know, increase that availability because that obviously makes a huge difference if you can get someone into permanent housing. Um, one small thing my office has heard that low credit scores are sometimes a barrier um, once someone has a voucher to actually using that voucher and wondering if you're doing anything with um, you know, potential landlords, I think we can all imagine that if you've been homeless or lost a job or been through a hard time, the idea of having a good credit score is the last thing you might have together in your life. And, you know, it's hard enough for people in normal family life to keep that looking good. So how can we help with that? And second around um, the uh, GDP program, which you just brought up, um, HR 95 is a bill that's sponsored by the majority of the House, I think 219 people, including me which would um, deal with some of the issues around homeless veterans with children. It would require the, or authorize the VA to pay uh, a partial per diem to GDP providers for each minor dependent. So I know you can't take a stand on a bill, but do you see this issue and, and would that be a positive way to help um, those individuals who are homeless and have kids? So it's all yours now. Thank you. And again, I'm sorry about the awkwardness of this mic. <laughs> You're but, managing um, just fine. Well, great. Um, uh, so HUD vash vouchers are important, um, but I'd like to flip that around a little bit. I think it's important for each community to look at what their needs are, and uh, HUD vash uh, um, vouchers are important for permanent housing. But does that community need a low demand program? Do they need more prevention dollars? Is uh, prevention and rapid rehousing more of a focus that could solve that individual community's need? So um, um, the ultimate goal is to get veterans into permanent housing, housing first model. Uh, but we like to look at each community, and that's why it's so important to do the community engagement and get these programs ramped up so that they're identifying veterans by list, uh, by name, by name list. And it also helps bring the community resources together. So uh, I know I'm talking around your question. I'm sorry about that. Uh, the HUD. Voucher allocation is a formula that the VA works with HUD. But I just want you to consider that all these programs are important and all these programs can be managed or resources depending on what that local community needs. And I'll just make a quick interjection. Um, and I agree, yes. Frankly, in our community, I'm sure if we had some of the people here work in this issue, they would say, yes, actually we need more resources in every program. And they've done a great job with Housing First. Um, they frankly have an amazing meeting that I think takes place once a week where they um, literally keep track of every individual that they know is on the street and they gather around 25 people around a table, work with all the coordinating agencies and say, you know, this person so-and-so, have you seen them? I saw them last Wednesday. How are they doing with their services? So there's phenomenal coordination in our state, but there truly is a lack of resources. Sure. Um, how about the homeless veterans with children? Um, there's and the credit score, uh, I'll jump to that first. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I haven't heard of, uh, well, I heard that they're not supposed to do that, but I'll follow up with you. Great. Um, homeless veterans with children, I ran the Grand Perdian program for a long time. 15 years, we actually started it up in our office. Um, I think there are other resources that may be more appropriate, just a personal opinion, uh, for uh, women with women with children. Uh, designing a transitional housing program for women with women, and then women with children take some structural thinking, services, kind of managing, and um, I guess I can't take a formal um, sure. support on it, but I think it's very much worth considering. But we need to consider the implications for that. Is, is there something else that may be better? But we have hoped to increase the per diem for a while, and some of that's tied up in legislation, whether it's for children or veterans. That 
Great. Well, thank you for your thoughts on that. And we'll follow up with you on those two issues, given particularly since you have such a long um, history of expertise on that. So thank you for your assistance. Thanks thank you, Madam question. Chair. Okay. Thanks, Ms. Pingree. Um, okay. We'll uh, proceed with a, se a second round of questions for those members that are able to remain. Um, I want to turn to a subject we have yet to touch on this morning, and that's military sexual trauma. Um, women are obviously disproportionately more likely to experience military sexual trauma, and I'm going to say the full term every time, not use the acronym, because to me that glosses over the problem. Um, I didn't even know what the acronym was when I first started hearing it used by um, both VA and DOD employees. One in five women seen in the VHA report having experienced military sexual trauma. This is a systemic issue, clearly, that ri arises that is beyond and outside of VA's control. But obviously, given that VA deals with many more individuals who are experiencing it over time than who uh, experience it on the, when they are in the military, I'd like to know how the VA is providing unique care to women who experienced military sexual trauma. How prevalent are the programs and resources? What kind of a priority is it to, at the VA to make sure that we can help women address uh, and meet their needs? And how are you raising awareness of the variety of military structural trauma programs available to all veterans? We want veterans to know these programs exist and are available to help them anytime they need. I have other questions around this, so if you can respond, and then I'll ask those. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And, and we share the concern about military sexual trauma. Uh, we work very closely with Dr. Patty Hayes and her office in the Women's Health Program, Dr. Susan McCutcheon in our office, who they is- were here last right, week. Right, who I believe were here last week. Uh, and and uh, talking about our, our um, so every VA facility has a women's health program coordinator. It's a full-time position. Uh, there are, uh, at our facilities, there are also at least two uh, providers in primary care uh, for women's uh, health issues. Uh, many facilities have women's health clinics. So we're looking at the environment of our facilities uh, as well as the staff who are trained, our women's mental health mini residencies programs has uh, trained uh, many uh, of our providers to have that awareness and the sensitivity of, of those kinds of issues. We also work very closely with our uh, vet center program because sometimes uh, women veterans may not want to, or, or even active duty military, sometimes come to our vet center programs for, for uh, military sexual trauma related issues. Okay, that, that doesn't feel very specific, Dr. Carroll. I, I, I have to tell you, um, I mean, we had a United States senator this week yes, who was a combat, a combat veteran, the first female combat pilot in the Air Force, uh, publicly talk about her experience with rape in the military. I mean, milita even using the term military sexual trauma glosses over what this is. It's rape. Prior to that, just a month or so ago, Senator Joni Ernst also publicly talked about her experience with military sexual trauma. This is a rampant problem. Again, it occurs outside of the VA, but it is something that you absolutely need to make sure you have detailed and specific programs to help make sure that whenever it manifests itself, because sometimes it may manifest itself later, that you're prepared to deal with it. And particularly because mixed gender treatment programs are not likely to be meeting the needs of a woman who has experienced military sexual trauma. How many facilities do not have women-only programs, and what are the VA's plans and timetable to provide those? And are there any plans for future buildings or complexes that take into account women's veterans' needs? And the rate of suicide, we've been talking about suicide and homelessness all, all morning. The rate of suicide is higher among women who have reported experiencing a military sexual assault. How do you cater your mental health programs to women based on their previous traumatic experiences as opposed compared to other women who did not experience military sexual trauma and as compared to men? Um, uh, thank you, ma'am. And the, the, uh, my response didn't ex 
include all that we have available for military sexual trauma. We also have military sexual trauma coordinators at every facility. We have a number of women-only residential treatment programs for military sexual trauma. I can get you the specific number and where they're located. Uh, the Going to the our larger conversation about patient-centered care, we want to provide the care that makes sense for each individual. In many cases, that uh, individual may want to be in a, a women's only treatment program or a treatment group or working with a gender specific provider. In other cases, they may not. They may choose to be in an integrated group. And, and part of our commitment is to make sure that we're addressing the unique needs of each individual. But we can get you the number is of that programs. that choice possible for women no matter where they're being treated in the yes. VA? So there's a women-only program in every single not in every in not in every single VA. I, I can get you the programs, but we can we can make referrals to of that individual to a program if that is what they need outside of the VA. Yes, but or or to another VA facility. Excuse me, which may or may not be near enough for them to actually choose to utilize. Right. So uh, again, what are the VA's plans to provide women-only programs accessible to every woman? who seeks treatment? We have outpatient programs at every facility, but the residential programs are not at every facility. And are there plans to make sure that there's a residential program at every VA facility that are women only? We will get you that information. We are expanding our residential programs this year. Okay, thank you. Judge Carter. And I thank, the, thank you for being recognized and what the, the chair is talking about is very serious, very important. I'm going to, I want to share something with you because I think it's unusual and I, and I think it might be a solution. I don't think we ought to be just asking you for solutions. We ought to have some ideas. I talked to a, a, a gathering of about 40 to 45 various service veterans over an education program we were doing in our district. I have Fort Hood in my district, so you'll hear me say Army more than anything else, but it applies to all services. And one of the comments about halfway through the presentation was, you know what's wrong with the military and what's wrong with the VA and everybody else? They don't realize this population is used to following orders. They're not used to making choices. They've been told when to eat, when to go to bed, when to get up, where to go, where to go when they report to a post, go here to get your living quarters, go here to get your health care, go here to go that. They are ordered to those places. But when you get out, they hand you a book or a list and say, these things are all available for you. Good luck. And he said, if somebody would have told me about the program, educational program we were talking about, and told me to check it out, not at, said, well, do what you want to, check this out. If you need housing, Report to this agency for housing. You need med immediately upon release from the, from the Army, report to the VA for your health care. You would, you would get more participation from veterans by ordering them to do it. Now, this is initially when you get out. I don't know whether it applies later in life. But, and, and, every, and I asked, I said, that's kind of sounds crazy to me. Does everybody agree with what he's saying? All 40 of them raise their hand. Tell me where to go. Don't make me try to figure out where to go. I want to be ordered to go there to get the services I need, and I'll go. I wanted to share that with you because there is a military factor here that that might be a key to get these people that are not reporting to the VA to at least upon release show up and sign up. And the same thing for housing. If you're gonna, if, and upon release from, from, this, from the services soldier, if you don't have a place to live, report to this agency. You see the difference? They're used to being told that. And I think that was a really insightful uh, comment on the mentality of our, our fighting men and women. They're used to following orders. And especially for our enlisted personnel, they don't feel that they should do it unless they're told to do it. And so they don't. 
Well, I wanted to share that because I've got to leave. But we got to start thinking about crazy other ideas. So I'll ask for your comments. Yeah, sir, if I may make a comment before you leave. Thank you for that. And that's, that is the type of thing that we are doing together with the Department of Defense. Over the last year, that transition assistance program, has the curriculum has been remodeled. And, we are, and VSOs are also participating in that new program. So we are, we are telling the active duty service members what's available and what's uh, to them when they get out. We're also helping them pre-enroll in VA health care so they don't have to think about that when they get out. We're also phone, phoning the service members after they transition uh, to help them activate that enrollment that they've started and also to check to see, do you need help with anything? How, how's it going? You've been out for three months now or six months now. So we're taking a much more proactive approach, reaching out to those uh, service members in those few uh, months after they separate. I think that's great. I just want to, it's a language. Soldier, report to the VA immediately upon release from the Army. That's an order. Soldier, report to, report to the Housing Authority immediately upon release from the Army. And we're working with... That's uh, the kind of sorry. thing they're used to hearing, and many, many of them will react to that immediately. Whereas, soldier, upon getting out, these are the options you have. I don't want options. Tell me where you want, want me to go. I don't know if these other veterans would agree with that, but I think that's an interesting concept. They're, after four to 20 years in the military, being told where to go all your life, all of a sudden, you're on your own. Yes, sir. Give me some orders. Tell me where to go. Thank you, Think sir. about it. Thank We're going to have to go. No, Thank, you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I, I want to follow up on uh, the, the chairwoman's question uh, with regard to military sexual assault. Is What's the peer-to-peer -peer model when you're hearing about women? And is there a peer-to-peer -peer model that is trying to address that, where you're getting women to go try to... To work with each work other. With each uh, other. Uh, other women who have been uh, similarly victimized, yes. Yeah. And is the peer-to-peer -peer model, it's like once you show up, then it's the peer-to-peer -peer model, right? Or like I sh I'm a vet, I show up at the hospital, that's when the peer-to-peer -peer engagement happens? It can happen. Yes, it does. It can happen in any number of ways. We have we have peer support specialists embedded in our mental health clinics. Where we are expanding them to our primary care clinics as well. And there are our peer health coaches. And perhaps Dr. Gaudet would want to uh, comment about that in terms of the whole health program. And we're also working with with service organizations because of the peer to peer contact that they have with other other veterans as well. I, I'm just you know I'm, I'm observing the the hearing here and our, our experiences over the last few years, how many vets don't come to the VA? Did you say of the 20 suicides, six have interfaced with the Six VA? have been enrolled in VA health care in the last year. There have been a few other touches. Maybe they've had a home loan right. or an education okay. benefit or a previous some episode benefit, of care. Some benefit. Right. The, the other 14, no contact with the VA. Well, th no, those are the group that may have had a home loan or an education oh. benefit or a previous contact uh, with the healthcare organization. So it's just the six are in the last two years. Okay, this I see. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I, we should talk about this offline, but I just think we need to have a more aggressive approach in trying to find these men and women who aren't necessarily coming in for a variety of different reasons, and we all hear all of the different reasons, but how do we explore some pilot programs? We're, we're going out and looking. We're going we're gonna to coach vets up on how to get on Facebook, how to get on social media, how to track some people down. I'm talking about walking around communities and going under the bridges yes. where there are mental health issues and all of all the other things, and, and pulling these vets out and letting them know that you know, we love them and we care about them and we don't want this for them and we're going to plug them into the VA system. How do we really go out and do that? I think those would be some interesting pilot programs. I got a couple quick questions. Um, one along the lines of uh, nonprofit organizations. I, I know there's a lot out there who serve vets, uh, have been very successful in attracting many of the post 9-11 veterans uh, who won't go out and seek VA care. We talked a little bit about it in a conversation with Dr. Gaudet. 
I've worked with some of these uh, groups. Boulder Crest is a great place right up the road from here. Project Welcome Home Troops, the David Lynch Foundation Foundation is doing some amazing work. I talked about uh, a lot of these uh, yoga vets and there's formal organizations around that. What are you doing to uh, interface with those groups? I know Boulder Crest, for example, has signed an MOU with the VA, but no further steps have been taken. What are we doing to make sure we pull those groups in? We are actively pursuing uh, partnerships and Boulder Crest uh, in terms of looking at their program and, and identifying research opportunities, uh, working with all of those groups. We're, we're trying to, to do it in a way that matches the veteran need and, and the communities that we can serve. Mm -hmm. um, so it is an important part of that public health strategy to engage with, with community uh, organizations, with veteran service organizations, veterans affinity groups. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's, it's an active part. We have, as I said earlier, over 60 f formal partnerships uh, in mental health and suicide prevention with different groups. Okay. I know, I know with, the, with Boulder Crest, there's, there's an MOU, but we want to get past the MOU into, into some action. The, the w adverse childhood experiences. Uh, talk about homeless, talking about patient-centered care. We're talking about suicides. We're talking about military sexual trauma. Um, we know that the ACEs are higher among military uh, than they are among the civil population. Um, what are we doing to coordinate and tailor treatment? Um, I, are we doing anything to really evaluate the adverse childhood experiences? Because you're hearing the same thing in defense that you're hearing with the vets. You're seeing our kids in schools. It's like this is, this is like we found, we've cracked the code here in a sense that it's the adverse childhood experiences that are leading to all of these other negative health, health outcomes and all kinds of other educational um, impediments and all the rest. What are we doing with, with regard to the VA to coordinate or tailor treatment based on these adverse childhood experiences? Tracy or Roger, want to say anything? But I, I told, it's just, open to just this memory. past week, we have uh, published a, a notice to VA providers summarizing the research on adverse childhood experiences and and instructing providers to, you know, look at this in terms of developing the care plan for for each individual veteran. So we're making a push to to raise awareness among VA providers around adverse childhood experiences and to drive them to incorporate that into their treatment planning so we, I, so we identify individuals who have that, that background. Do you need any authorities from Congress in order to help along these lines? Um, I mean, I, to me, we, we should know, I'm running really late here, but to me, we should know everybody who's moving into the VA, what their experiences are, especially kids, because a lot of these kids come right out of high school, we're working on the Defense Appropriations Committee on trying to evaluate everybody who's coming into the military. Not that we're going to deny them, but that we're going to know exactly what these kids need. And they're kids. I mean, these are kids. I mean, I'm 45 now. I didn't used to think 18 was a kid, but these are young, young kids coming into our care. And I think if we're going to fully um, amplify the opportunities with the training and their post-military career experiences, we need to help them deal with this stuff. And we can't until we get some real information on. Well, we appreciate your happening. support. I think we need to make sure that that information follows the individual, you know, and I think that that's yeah. what we, we need to make sure that we have that interoperability, that shared information between departments. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair, for your generosity. Oh, you're welcome. Um, this is such an incredibly important issue, which is why we held the hearing. And by the way, making sure that we can have an interoperable electronic health record as soon as we can get it to stand stood up would be the best way to make sure that we could have that access to that kind of data. Um, with that, uh, I want to thank the remaining committee member who is still here, and Mr. Ryan. The ranking member. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Um, well. You're, you're chair of another subcommittee, don't forget. Uh, one that should not be you know, un underestim underestimated. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for your time, for your service. I think if we learned anything today, it's that we have a long way to go and a, a pretty big mountain to climb on all of these very serious, life-threatening, life-altering issues. 
and it's uh, th these are our priorities of the committee and we'll be staying on top of them. Uh, so thank you for the work that you do. Uh, just to remind members uh, for the record that our next hearing will be uh, next Tuesday, March 12th for the related agency's budget hearing. That hearing will be at 10.30 a.m. in 2362B Rayburn House Office Building and the subcommittee stands adjourned. Thank you.